This meeting is being live streamed. This meeting is, is officially started. Can you see my candle? This candle is about keeping the flame alive. Welcome to Community Church of Boston. We're 102 years old and we're doing our seat of the pants best to keep this flame alive. Who's, who's talking? We will keep this flame alive as best we see that the pants <laughs> know how to do. Uh, and, and it's a beautiful flame because, uh, because of what we're celebrating this morning. And that is uh, the legacy of Howard Zinn and what he left for this place, uh, which we're just beginning to discover in the form of numerous recordings of over 30 years of, uh, of his participation with Community Church. So welcome, everybody. And uh, let's keep the flame alive by just saying Happy New Year and also starting with, with a, a really sad, another sad remembrance. John Mannheim Presente. And um, a lot of you might not know that name, but those of us who have who have been around this place a little while know that this was a, uh, a key, serious flame alive keeper. John Mannheim lived in Concord, Massachusetts and, um, and came all the way in here every Sunday without fail. John Mannheim uh, served on several board positions. He was president, he was vice president, but most of all, he was treasurer for 15 years. John Mannheim was the um, uh, chief negotiator uh, for the Mass Teachers Association, and um, in that capacity uh, led all kinds of, of um, negotiating with um, with with the authorities on teachers' issues, and he was a serious uh, labor force in this in this city. And um, you can find his obituary, uh, our our website and Facebook page, and and the email that we sent out has a link to the obituary. And there will be um, memorial service. I'm just thinking, especially of John, because of it just it being uh, yet another broken link to, to our rich times in the 70s and 80s when we were meeting at Boston University's Morse Auditorium, uh, when we were uh, just featuring an incredible array of, of speakers um, to, it was the end of our, our large auditorium um, experience, which started I don't know if you can believe this, but uh, with Symphony Hall in the th in the 30s and 40s, uh, audiences of 2,000, 2,500 people coming to hear the likes of W. B. Du Bois, um, Robert Frost, uh, um, Thurgood Marshall, Martin Luther King in the 50s, um, and. Slowly, things changed, and the media landscape changed, and and but we're still here, and we have this beautiful building, and so uh, welcome, and um, let's let's celebrate the legacy of Howard Zinn for for a couple hours here, and uh, let's start with a song that, that kind of reminds me of Howard uh, because because of of the need for an alternative voice. God bless the grass that grows through the crack. They pour the concrete over it to try to keep it packed. But the concrete gets tired of what it has to do. It breaks and it buckles and the grass grows through. And God bless the grass. God bless the grass, God bless the truth that fights toward the sun. They 
and roll the lies over it that they think that it is done. It moves through the ground and reaches for the air. And after a while, it is growing everywhere. And God bless the grass. God bless the grass that's gentle and low. Its roots are deep and its will is to grow. And God bless the truth, the friend of the poor. And the wild grass growing by the poor man's door. serious uh, 15 minutes of, of fame was called Little Boxes. Okay. Little Boxes. Um, into the new year we are and uh, I want to let you know that if you're on our mailing list we're going to send out a, a, a compilation of all of last year's uh, talks. Links, links to every single one of them in case you missed any of them. And um, they, they're they all a little bit of a haze. I have to look at that list to remember the, the year. But the one that just sticks out is the last one we had, which was um, our Sacco and Vanzetti Award, which went to Miko, I'm sorry, which went to uh, the survivors of the War on Terror. And it featured uh, the Holy Land Foundation Five uh, and Sami al -Aryan. And um, again, that link is on, our, uh, on our, our website and on the email that we will send out. And um, just a remarkable, moving thing. Three of these Holy Land Foundation men are still in, in prison, serving long sentences. We had members of their family here to speak about them. We also had Sami al Aryan, who was deported to Turkey, where he is now a professor. And he spoke as well. And um, it was just this community church thing because this Holy Land Foundation case is, is just a spitting image of the Sacco Vanzetti case. Um, and um, I urge you all to look into it and find out more about the Holy Land Foundation Five and how we can get them released from prison. Uh, righteous men who got scapegoated in, in the time of national hysteria after 9-11. We also happen to have a, at the church um, copies of Miko Pellet's book that's called Injustice, which is about this, this case of the Holy Land Foundation Five. Uh, we'd love to get a copy in your hands. Um, and, uh, so uh, come by. Come by on Wednesday. We have an open house every Wednesday. We serve Salvadoran pupusas, and uh, you can get a tour of all our collections. We have uh, a serious uh, Sacco and Vanzetti primary source collection on the third floor that we inherited from Bob D'Atilio, who was a Sacco and Vanzetti scholar. A ton of a mountain of books that we are trying to discern whether to hold as a library some of them and what to get rid of or swap. Uh, we just have lots of books and it's, it's uh, really a, a treasure that, that we have. And, um, and we invite you to come share it with us. On the fourth floor, we have the History Project, which is uh, a new tenant. And we are just so excited to have them because they are um, uh, keepers of the LGBT flame in the city of Boston. They record, archive, and preserve the history of, of LGBT culture and, and life in, in Boston. The fifth floor, of course, is our own archives, and it's spread all over the entire uh, um, space up there, and, we, uh, and it's in need of lots of attention 
I was just up there trying to find some more Howard Zinn tapes, and I realized how 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 much work is needed up there because it's just too precious a thing to to let dissolve, and we need some grants uh, grants up there to to archive and preserve, uh, and we need a lot of volunteer efforts as well. Um, glad to take folks up there and show you a little bit of, of, of what we have, 102 years of, of history up there. Um, well, uh, this is gonna be a free for all and it's, it's very free form. Um, and, and we're just gonna start right into it. Um, but Steve, Steve, um, there's just somebody who, um, hold on. Steve, come on in, everybody. We have a lot of folks still coming in. And uh, I wish we had what we used to have, which is an official greeter uh, who would uh, say hello to people when they came in and, and, and uh, uh, lead them to their, to their seat, wherever they were, were staying. But um, uh, we'll get that in place eventually as well. Uh, so, Come on in, and um, and I'm going to start with with a little reading, and then a song, and then we're going to we're gonna dig into hearing from Jeff and hearing some some selections from Howard's tapes. Um, this one, there's there's like six or seven Howard's in. Uh, titles that, that I found in a cursory search. Uh, and this one is called Artists in Times of War. And, um, and I started reading about Emma Goldman and Howard wrote a play about Emma Goldman. And I, I just thought I'd read a little bit. It, 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 just, uh, it just speaks volumes to me. Um, and by the way, if you're interested in Emma Goldman, uh, Bob Dottilio uh, bequeathed to us a whole bunch of biography and, and material about Emma Goldman that's up on our third floor. Uh, come and check it out. Um, if you are a student of hers or interested in finding out more about her. And I'm sure Howard would be interested in these books too. I can never stay with history. I can never just stay with the past. I became a historian and went into the past for the purpose of trying to understand and do something about what is going on in the present. I never wanted to be the kind of historian who goes into the archives and you never hear from him again. My work on Emma Goldman has always been connected to the things in the world with which I am active and involved, but I had only been vaguely been aware of her before the 1960s. It was interesting, there I was, a PhD in history and what could be higher than that? Who could be better informed than a PhD in history? So there I was with a doctorate from Columbia University and Emma Goldman had never been mentioned in any of my classes. None of her writings had ever appeared on my reading list. And I only vaguely remembered reading a chapter about her in an old book called Critics and Crusaders. Not long after receiving my doctorate, I attended a conference in Pennsylvania. Sometimes at conferences, you run into interesting people and this time I ran into Richard Drinnen, a remarkable historian. Drinnen told me he had written a biography of Emma Goldman, Rebel in Paradise. So I went to find it and read it and was just astonished. It made me angry about the fact that I had not been told anything about Emma Goldman in my long education. Here was this magnificent woman, this anarchist, this feminist, this fierce life-loving person. Of course, that led me to her autobiography, Living My Life, which if you have not read, you should read. At a certain point, I decided to require it for a class of 400 students. At first I thought living my life is a big book. And I asked myself, will they really connect with this early 20th century woman while here we are in the 1960s? My students loved it and they found in her what I found, a free spirit, boldness, a woman who spoke out against all authority, unafraid and as the title of her book suggests, living her life as she wanted to live it, not as the rules and regulations and authorities were telling her how to live it. 
That got me interested in Emma Goldman in reading her and using her stuff in my classes. It wasn't until around 1975, however, the year the war in Vietnam ended that I had a breathing spell and could actually address Emma Goldman at length. I had always been interested in theater. My wife had acted, my daughter had acted, my son was in the theater and still is, and I had always been interested in the theater and never done anything with it because I was always too involved in the civil rights movement and in the Vietnam War movement. So I wrote a play about Emma Goldman and I had to make a decision. Her life was so long and full and in any work of art, I like to call what I do art. There's always a problem of what to leave in and what to leave out. There's so much to her life. So I started with her as an immigrant girl, a teenager living in Rochester, New York and working in a factory. Her political awareness takes a leap in 1886 at the time of the Haymarket Affair. Anyway, she, he goes on and talks uh, in, in great length about the Haymarket Affair. Artists in the times of war. Um, I could go on and on, but that gives you a, a little sense of, of just the beautiful accessibility and, um, and uh, language of, of Howard Zinn. So, um, one more little song and then we'll, we'll get deep into it. production. I want to uh, also um, uh, introduce you to Amar Ahmad, who is at my side here. We're, we're trying a lot of different configurations of, um, uh, of, of, of how to do this uh, hybrid uh, productions, uh, which, are, which are both physical and, uh, and virtual, and how to do them well with grace and elegance and style. And, and it's not an easy thing. We have a, a flat screen TV over here. And we have about a dozen people here in the room. And welcome who, those of you who are in the old fashioned presence of actually being in, in a room together. That feels good, but it feels awkward trying to do both things at the same time. I will admit some people are already good at that and, and we're, we're not, but we, we do our best and, and we recognize the value of it. Anyway, this is, this is a song that's become a, a community church anthem. Um, this is written by a Boston songwriter named Jim Infantino. Rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. The land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up and claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Arise, arise, arise. Do not beg for your salvation. From people, preachers, kings, and masters, the people hold the power. Arise and claim your freedom. The wealthy and the powerful, they are only human beings. On earth we are all equal. Arise, arise, arise. Step out. 
out into the sunlight. Arise, 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 you lonely wanderers. Arise, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. The land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up and claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Arise, arise, arise. Because in the end, freedom will be. Because in the end, freedom will be international. Why don't I go ahead and introduce Jeff Zinn, who is, of course, Howard's son and is a um, wonderful actor and playwright and, I'm sorry, and, and, and involved in a lot of film in his own right. You can find his, uh, his uh, credits and, uh, online, but he didn't want me to, to do that. He wanted this to be about Howard. So I'm just go ahead, gonna go ahead and, and uh, introduce Jeff. It's really an honor to have you with us this morning. And uh, we uh, uh, went through, found out on August 23rd that I think August 24th was his 100th birthday. And it was a little too late to, uh, to kind of recognize how much of, of Howard there is in, in our history and get something together in time for his birthday. But this is a, a wonderful consolation. And we're just so glad that you were willing to, to be with us and share about dad. Folks, Jeff Zinn. Thank you, Dean. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be here and th thank you for doing this and honoring uh, my father. Um, I'm sure he would he would really be happy. I mean, he spent so much time with you guys and, and uh, appreciated what you do so much. So um, it's, it's terrific that you're doing this tribute. I want to say that um, one, there was, there was one last, uh, one last little word from Howard. Um, we, we lost touch with him in the 90s. He didn't speak in the 90s, but we, we brought him back in the year 2000 to receive the, the, our annual Saquon Vanzetti Award. And he gave a talk about the Saquon Vanzetti case. And I looked like crazy for that cassette. And it wasn't there. And I dare say it's not there, which is too bad. Uh, we've, over the years, had differ, differing kind of disciplines about about recording and about labeling. There's tons of cassettes up there that aren't, aren't labeled or the spine is not labeled and it's labeled inside. So you can't tell looking, uh, looking at a, a whole box of tapes if there's one that's, that's Howard in there. Um, it, it's going to require a whole bunch of, of loving and tedious work to, to really get, a, get stock of what is there and, and hold it on our 102nd anniversary and, and cherish it and, and get it out to the world. Um, so that's, that's our start. And we're gonna, um, Amar has, who is, who is a newest, youngest member on our team has um, done some digitizing of, of cassettes. Um, and we're gonna play an, an excerpt and we feel like we're just at the beginning of, of, of an adventure finding this, this history and um, not only the cassettes, but there's there's like five different obsolete formats. There's VHS, there's um, there's CD, there's DVD. You remember all of those? <laughs> they used to really. I actually have an, a room in the attic that's called the Museum of Obsolete Media. Um, we don't have any any recordings on LP. That, that was, uh, but. Um, Anyway, we're going to hear an excerpt that we uh, we transferred from cassette onto uh, onto uh, digital file, and it, it you can find these on YouTube, 
And as we find them and are able to digitize them, uh, we're going to have them all up there. We, um, we make sure that we back them up on our own um, hard drive because you know how YouTube is a private company and they can take down whatever they deem uh, inappropriate in their own mind. And that's true of all these mega social media companies. And some of the speakers that have spoken here have had that happen to them. Chris Hedges, for example, um, uh, a bunch of them. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a, a dependable thing. I mean, they, the idea of just recording, and that's an archive there. I mean, we've recorded everything that we've done, and it's all on YouTube. Um, as far as, as we know, all of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And some of the, I, I, I say that the best advantage of it is that you can fast forward the, the, the boring parts, like Dean talking on and on and on. Um, so no more blah, blah. And let's hear an ex excerpt from, uh, from one of Howard's uh, talks. What, what is this one called? Staying Alive in the 80s. Staying Alive in the 80s. Here we go. Was a bow. And I told her that I didn't know that and referred her to Professor Howard Zinn. This is Bill and so uh, Howard is going to be on. Uh, there's a Channel 7 morning program uh, hosted by Ted O'Brien. And it, it's going to be taped Thursday, and it might air Friday morning. I did want to uh, announce that. Howard Zinn is professor of political science at Boston University. His latest book is The People's History of the United States. He is a most perceptive, caring, eth ethically sensitive, and courageous man. I'm very honored to present him, and the title of his address is Staying Alive in the 80s. Howard Zinn. happy to come to the community church. I've never been happy about coming to churches in general, but uh, this is a very special place. Uh, you see what I mean? Uh, <laughs> they don't allow children to cry in all churches or to yell or speak or have children's programs right out there in front of adults so that adults can be educated the way children are. Uh, and you, there aren't many churches maybe aren't any churches where you can hear the story of Adam and Eve told as I heard it <laughs> in some astonishment just a little while ago. Uh, I, th I think we need a, a revised edition of the Bible and uh, with, with that story of Adam and Eve in it. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, and to uh, talk about staying alive in the 80s, uh, which is a title I thought up before I knew what it meant. That is this, you know, you know the secret of titles. Secret of titles is that people invite you to speak and they say, what will you speak about? You think about something that you would like to hear somebody speak about. And so you give the title, and then you have the problem of figuring out what it means and what, therefore, you should say. So I, I thought about it. Um, although, frankly, whenever I'm at the community church, I always have this feeling that the people here know everything that I tell them, <laughs> you see. <laughs> And they're, they're the most remarkably polite people in the world. They don't let on. <laughs> they, they act as if you know, they're hearing something new, different. But I, I know that they secretly know everything I tell them. But they just want to hear it again. 
Uh, and I go on because, I guess, I want to hear it again myself. <laughs> so. I'm going to share that link in the. If you want to hear the entire link, uh, the, the entire talk, you can find it on our YouTube channel. And uh, Amar is sharing the link um, on the, uh, in the in the chat. And um, and Jeff, uh, what's it like to hear Dad? Well, I I must say that I often am struck with the with the notion that I'm incredibly lucky that if I want to hear my dad, I can go on YouTube and there's a bottomless well of videos and speeches and interviews and um, and and I think lots of, well, not lots of people, everyone <laughs> loses their parents um, and they don't have the luxury of being able to um, listen to them the way the way I do. Uh, so I'm very, I'm very grateful to, to have his voice and his humor and um, yeah. And he, that, that was him. That was all him. Well, um, the last we heard from Howard was 2009 and it was, uh, uh, it was in the form of a check. We sent out a, uh, a, a fundraising plea to raise funds for the expenses, the immigration lawyer expenses of our um, cook and uh, janitor, Luis Guzman. And here comes a check for $200 from, from Howard Zinn. And uh, we look at it and it, it's just like this, this fabled creature that uh, our, our figure that we hadn't heard from in a long time. So 20 years later, thank you, Howard. Um, and um, it went to a good purpose. Luis is still with us and he has made us lunch for, for today. It's, it's, it's pupusas and uh, actually he didn't make it. He got it from a restaurant in Chelsea today. It's, it's a catered affair. A catered affair, I guess. Um, uh, so, um, Let's let's listen to another excerpt. Are, are we ready for for another one? Give me a second. Um, this is uh, sure we can turn down the lights. Let's let's get this going. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll um, there's not much to see because it's just an audio uh, clip. But uh, uh, yeah, we'll we'll turn down some lights. Here's a here's a story he was describing about a Green Party conference in Nuremberg. Here's, here's a bar. So, so, so this next clip is a story Howard Zinn was describing from attending a Green Party conference in Nuremberg. Jill Stein was with us just, uh, just two weeks ago. Uh, she would love to hear this. We'll, we'll tell her about it. Uh, well, the talk was given in 1983. So the, the, actually, the title of this address is called The Legacy of Karl Marx. Uh, we, we need some of those lights over. Is that better? Muffin Traber, whom you know as Masha Traber, because that's the way she's listed on the program. Masha! Uh, but who is known to her intimates as Muffin Traber, uh, and whom uh, I encountered in a surprise, didn't know the community church had its agents all over the world there, <laughs> encountered there in, in Nuremberg uh, last month. Uh, and at that, at that conference of the Greens, which both, both of us attended, uh, there was a, one interesting witness uh, among the 62 of us who were so-called witnesses at this three-day conference. 
very intense. Uh, one of them was an, a, an American uh, who had been an officer in the Air Force. I don't know if you, were, if you had already left Muffin when he spoke. Yeah, I think. Uh, so I may as well inform you. Just look upon this as my telling you about this with other people listening. <laughs> uh, he had been in the American Air Force. He was an officer in the Air Force. He was in charge of a nuclear installation in England. That is, he was in charge of an installation that had nuclear weapons aimed at the Soviet Union. And uh, this was in the early 1960s when he first began working there. Then came the Vietnam War, and the Vietnam War made him begin to question what the United States was doing, not only in Vietnam, but elsewhere in the world. Made him think about American foreign policy. Made him look around at his own nuclear installation. For instance, in order to fire the nuclear weapons, Two keys had to be turned simultaneously. The two keys were 10 feet apart. Very clever. So that no one maniac could fire the nuclear weapons. Only two maniacs <laughs> could fire the nuclear weapons. <laughs> That, that was a particularly lovely one because it just so happens that that muffin Masha Traver happens to be on this Zoom call. And I hope I'm not um, uh, putting the spotlight on you by, by saying, hi, Masha, it's great to see you. And I wonder if you can tell us if you remember that. And, and, uh, it, and uh, I think it'd be kind of hard to, to not remember that. But uh, Masha, are you, are you able to unmute and Talk to us. Yes, I'm. I'm young enough to actually be able to unmute. Um, <laughs> um, yes, I'm so surprised. I just had had texted Jeff that I had seen him in Nuremberg, and then found out that I was I was coming home. I was living in Germany for three years, and I was working at that time with the CBC crew, Canadian Broadcasting, as their translator and production assistant. And we went to that Greens conference in Nuremberg. And there was Howard and I was like, oh my God, this is so crazy because I had known Howard since I was about 16. Um, and just briefly, uh, I went to Newton South High School and we had a walkout in the May of 1970 and Howard was invited to be at our sit-ins, you know, at our, our, our teach-ins or whatever. But nobody at Newton South High School knew what he looked like except for moi because I'd been going to community church since I was 13. So I knew what he looked like and I waited for him out front and, you know, ushered him in and, uh, and that was great. But then, you know, it's, uh, he always either opened or closed our year at community church. We had bookended. We we're always bookended. Um, and when I say I was 13, I was at community church since 1965 and my mother went in the thirties at symphony hall. But um, uh, we always bookended with Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn. And um and so Howard was a great friend of mine and, and a great, not friend, because he wasn't a friend, but he was a wonderful idol of mine. And when I found out that he was going to be there and I'd been asked when I came home for a short visit, well, I was living in Germany and then going home, blah, blah. Uh, I was asked to report on the German peace movement. So I was sharing the stage with him, which was an incredible honor for me, Jeff. Uh, to to presume to share the stage. And, you know, when I saw him, I said, hey, um, you know, he said, oh, I'm going to be speaking at community church in two weeks. And I said, so am I, <laughs> you know. So it was just a terrific coincidence. And uh, and it was lovely. And I don't know if he remembered me that much when he saw me in Nuremberg, because, you know, I, he'd only see me once a year or something. I wasn't a big deal. I didn't take any courses from him. But it was just wonderful to see him and his book, Why Are We in Vietnam?, uh, I just, you know, before people's history or anything, that was the Bible. That was the Bible for arguing with people, for for informing people about why we were there. That was that was it. It's slim volume, very slim volume, but it put it all out there. And um, he was a great, 
uh, my family. I think my mother described him as lovely and he's just got a delightful sense of humor, she used to say. And, you know, our whole family just, my, which was my mother, my father and I, just adored him. So I just wanted to let you know. And, you know, he's very missed. I saw him, the last time I saw him in person was when they did that big tribute to the people's history down in, in Boston at what's the big, one of the big theaters there. And um, what's her name? Um, Washington, um, Carrie Washington spoke. And I think, I think Matt Damon was there and they did, a, and people did readings from his book. Were you there, Jeff? No. So people did readings from his book and it was a big deal. It filled the hall. And that was the last I saw of him in person. I guess he was for his 80th birthday. I think it was. <clears throat> and Myla and the family were living around the corner from my daughter for several years, although they were not seen in the neighborhood that much. But um, I knew all the kids. I knew all her, all her children, all, you know. So anyway, and, you know, when I found out that she was living there and she was Howard's daughter, you know, I was very excited. And, and we were at the Waldorf school together and then at Clark uh, Middle School. So that's all I have. So anybody else has a story about Howard's Inn they can share? Um, but I, I'm sorry. We're, we're, was the event you're talking about um, the taping of uh, voices of the people? The people speak voices of it. Was was it like in? I I think that might be what you're talking about. And if that's the case, then yes, I was there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It, they they, uh, they taped it over uh, a, Two a days? span. A span of several days, and and uh, then it was it was made into a into a film, which is really beautifully done. Well, if Kerry Washington was in it, then it's the same thing we're talking about. Yeah, there were there were uh, there were quite a few quite a few people in it. Um, I was uh, privileged to take part in the very first uh, Voices of the People. Sp- Voices of the People Speak event that took place at the 92nd Street Y. Um, and that was, um, boy, I don't even remember the year that was, but that was the very first time that had been done. And and uh, there were some amazing people uh, speaking there, including Alfre Woodard. And, and uh, there was Patti Smith sang and Kurt Vonnegut was there and... Uh, James Earl Jones. I mean, it was it was uh, Andre Gregory. It was quite an event. Anyway, thank you. Wow. I want to tell about the last time. Well, first, first, I want to say that that uh, my first contact with Community Church of Boston was in the '80s, and it was going to Morse Auditorium to hear Zinn Chomsky. Kozol, those three spoke numerous times and and were just such an amazing um, set of voices. Um, we have to try to get Jonathan Kozol to, to come speak again. Um, and uh, to me, it was it was like this is. Uh, I quote Miko Pellet, who was who was just here two weeks ago. He looked around and says. Is this a church? <laughs> kind of like this quizzical look on his face, and and I had that same feeling when I first walked in, and um, you know, with a, a background of 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 all the things that I didn't like about church, like most most of their feelings uh, or their sense of of inflated self importance, and like that they were the only path to enlightenment or heaven or or whatever uh, the the notion that that here's a place that accepts all was just beyond me you know i i want to go just spend a little bit of time back in the archives i grabbed a uh, uh, just want to get you all just fired up about these archives this is this is one yearbook that includes a season of, of community church, which goes from October, roughly October to June. And this is 1948. And, um, and uh, it's definitely before Howard Zinn, uh, but he was a fighter pilot in World War II. So it was 
Um, and it has has a bunch of interesting things. The, the one is that that they're talking and talking and, and talking about what is community church, <laughs> which is uh, working in the archives. I've, I've started a category, and, and the category is is what is community church, and it's just a pile of of different declarations from all kinds of ministers and, and people who have spoken and people who are, who are in leadership here. And um, here's here's one I like from 1948. Uh, distinctive features of community church. The community church offers an adventurous religion for free minds derived from the prophetic leaders of all the great world faiths. The community church suggests a way of life, not a pattern of belief, holding that deeds are more important than creeds. Community church possesses no barriers of creed or doctrine to stand in the way of a universal religion. The community church accepts the discipline and welcomes the findings of science as the most valid method of truth seeking. The community church united, uniting bond is a common dedication to the purpose of elevating and ennobling the quality of human life on earth. Um, the, the speaker that day was a guy named John Roy, Roy Carlson, who was, he was kind of a, um, uh, he investigated um, secret right-wing groups. Um, and this one in, in particular is called the, the, the Christian Front. And um, it sounds like a really interesting guy. And uh, I want to find the program. Here's, here's the actual um, bulletin of, of what what was going on it looked uh, and and it looked much more like a church service back then it had it had um a choir and it had an organist and a soprano soloist and um and hymns that were the, the, the lyrics are on the back and it had this thing that's called the response which is kind of like a doxology you know and um it just prints out the the uh, the the, the, the words and through the years, this response has has uh, kind of um, morphed from this. Here, here it's it's um, throughout the world, new patterns form. A sense of oneness grows. Now, power is ours to claim and use. Through faith, the current flows. And what I don't know is what melody they used back then for. To, to do that response, uh, and it, he, I, I thought of a few. One, one is, throughout the world, new patterns form. A sense of oneness grows. Now power is ours to claim and use. Throughout, through faith, the current flows. In other words, House of the Rising Sun, you think they might have used that one? I don't, I don't know, but it, it works. Here's, here's another Try one. old hundred. Throughout the world, new patterns form. A sense of oneness grows. Now power is ours to claim and use. Through faith, the current flows. There's probably a melodies you could use, but I don't know which one it is. And we're slowly losing our our um, our strings of uh, our our bands to those old days, uh, where we could find out. Maybe we should ask. Tilly, are you there? Or, or um, who else might there be who could remember that uh, um, that day? That that tradition of sort of a real kind of churchy thing stopped stopped happening like in the late '60s, and, and it became more of more of a uh, a folk format. Uh, but I just want to remember my last. One of one of one of my contacts with Howard was that he and 500 others of us were arrested in 19, May 1st, 1985 um, uh, in, in the JFK building in downtown Boston, uh, protesting uh, the, the, um, the mining of Nicaraguan harbors. Um, also among the, those 500 uh, were uh, Noam Chomsky <laughs> and me, Howard, and Noam Chomsky, that's the ones that, that I remember. I was there, and we all got bust. Somehow they, they, uh, they, uh, they rented on short notice uh, about uh, at least 20 buses uh, to, of people to arrest. They put like little 
little ties on us and and they took us all up to some place some uh like a place in lawrence um some uh, correctional uh, facility of some kind and um and they let us go the next morning and and a week later uh the the, the attorney general or the uh of, of massachusetts or, or no no it was the the from the federal system now comes whatever his name was and and um and releases and basically drops the charges against you because you're too unwieldy a group we can't we can't process you all uh, so that's 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 a good memory of of howard 1985 um, uh, let's hear one more excerpt and maybe um um open it up to to memories and um jeff just one one that i saw from from leonard lerman was just just a, after after this excerpt what was it like growing up as with Howard Zinn as your father? Um, well, uh, I guess what what I would say is that, especially in in later years, um, I relied on him as someone that I could go to, uh, you know, to uh, to to talk about what was going on in the world and to hear his take on things. He always had a take on things, whatever it was. And um, we didn't always agree. Um, I, I often or sometimes describe myself as slightly to the right of Howard, um, which is uh, to say um, quite a bit to the left of almost anyone else. Um, but uh, it, it was, um, you know, he, he, was, he was a great, he was a great resource in that way. And, and I mean, he was, he was a wonderful father. I mean, I, I should just say that, you know, he was very, um, I mean, one of the things that, that I'd like to say about my dad is that he was very much the same person in private um, that he presented in public. Um, there really wasn't like a different persona that switched on when he was, you know, in front of a microphone or a camera, he was, he was, um, very, you know, comfortable in his own skin and, and, uh, um, and he was, he was that guy, very, uh, you know, very intelligent, very, uh, self-deprecating in a way, um, you know, always, always listening to what you had to say. Uh, and then he would uh, gently uh, tell you why you were full of shit, um, or uh, wh why the, you you might have a there might be a slightly different way of of looking at at things. Um, but um, I don't know if that answers your question. But uh, you know, and he was my dad, right? <laughs> so, what was it like being his son? Well, it was like being a lot of uh, it was just being a kid. Um, there was no, uh, uh, there, there, there was no, um, sort of darker side, if you will. What was the first event he took you to? <laughs> well, I actually have a, have a, a good story there that the very first event, uh, sort of political event that I attended was, um, in 1949. Um, and I was born in December of 1949. So um, it was the uh, Peekskill concert of Pete Seeger and Paul Robeson. And um, it's often described as the Peekskill riots. Well, I was uh, in utero and uh, my mother and father went to this incredible concert, which became famous because the uh, the local population of Peekskill, New York, um, basically it was like a, you might think of it as a think think of what happened on January six. There were you know they they basically stormed the venue uh, where this concert was going to take place, and they lined the the very narrow roadway, uh, and and they as all the folks, including my parents drove out they were pelted with rocks and bottles and windows were smashed and 
And so, um, uh, I guess you could say I was there, uh, not, not conscious, but there. Um, and, uh, I don't really remember going to many events, uh, you know, until maybe when we were, by the time we got to Atlanta and I was conscious, I was, you know, six years old on, and there were many uh, interesting events, many concerts and uh, uh, speaking engagements. We lived on the campus of Spelman College and there was uh, a lot of a lot of great music. Um, the the freedom singers performed, and uh, and I think over the course of my life, I must have attended a dozen Pete Seeger concerts, and uh, where I was always a little bit annoyed because as soon as he would begin singing, the entire uh, congregation, if you could call it that, would would start singing along, and I was like, I want to hear him. I don't want to hear all these people singing in my ear, but that's what it was all about. It was, uh, singing along with Pete. Anyway, it was fun. Do we have uh, an excerpt? Sure. Amar is going to play. Uh, and tell me the, the name of this talk. Uh, again, this is uh, The Legacy of Karl Marx. The Legacy of Karl Marx. Whoops. Uh, conference organized by the Green Party. It was not just the Green Party, it was people left from all over the world. Uh, people left from all countries. It was a wonderful gathering. It was an international gathering. If there is any imp anything in Marx, which it seems to me is critically important in that legacy he leaves to us, it's the legacy of internationalism. The idea that these boundaries that separate us all over the world, that carve up the world into these places where people need passports and visas and can't get in and can't get out, with their flags and national anthems and people willing to kill one another over the difference in a flag or a national anthem or a boundary. Uh, all that has to be done away with. People have to do away with it first in their minds, have to think themselves out of those national boundaries and begin making contacts with one another, stretch out to one another all over the world, create an international society, understand that we have a, a common interest, no more national interest. None of this business of national interest, national defense, it's all a lie. There is no such thing as national interest anymore. There's only international interest. There's only the interest of all people all over the world, on all sides of these boundaries, an interest that all people have in common, an interest that they have in common against those in all countries who would consign them to poverty, to death, to exploitation. Uh, that kind of internationalism is what Marx stood for. And that kind of internationalism, it seems to me, is uh, what we need to be thinking about and acting upon uh, very, very hard. And that's why it's good to hear reports from Germany, reports of what's going on in Central America, and to see the community church devoting itself to spreading that kind of word. It's a very good legacy. Thank you. All right. International. He, he would have like that that international song that we just sang um, i've got a um another book here that is it's basically a compilation of of all the sunday speakers that have spoken here all the way to 1921 and it goes all the way to 2017 we have five more years to add to this book uh, 2017 to now uh, but here's here's some pink post-its that you can see on the top and um, those those are all the all the times that Howard spoke here. Uh, it's, it's it's a whole bunch. Um, previous there were some yellow ones. Can you see the yellow ones? Those are those are a program that we did um, uh, earlier about Scott Nearing, who spoke here even more than 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 Noam because he went back to the beginning of 
of the, of the, the church uh, and spoke all the way into the 70s. And um, anyway, before we open this up, uh, maybe just to, to some, some memories and conversations, I, I want to read some of um, the talks, uh, the, the titles. Uh, let's see. Dr. Howard's in. The first one I can find is 1965, An Ethical Evaluation of U.S. Involvement in Vietnam, 1965. Um, 1966, um, let's see, I should have marked these. Where is he? Dr. Howard's in Vietnam, The Logic of Immediate Withdrawal. 1967, that was actually. Um, for these years, it looks like he was speaking almost every year. October 15th, 67, Dr. Howard Zinn, what does the Vietnam War reveal about the American people? 68. Um, actually, it was 69, uh, May 25th. Doctors, Dr. Howard's in Dissent and Democracy. May 17th, 1970, The Conspiracy of Law. I could go on and on. It would take me a long time, but that's that's just a start. Um, and it looks like he was he was in a pattern during the Lothrop years of speaking every single year um, in the 60s and into the 70s. So it's a pretty pretty marvelous thing. Well, um, if folks want to want to put some some impressions in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand and just um, just be recognized. Um, uh, um, Leonard is the first one. Um, go ahead and unmute Leonard and, and speak to us. Good morning, Leonard. Good morning, Community Church Dean and Jeffson. It's a pleasure and a privilege to meet with you. So you were in utero during Pete's Gill. Well, I was born that week, so we, we have that in common. I was born in Kansas, but my parents followed everything. And because uh, it was a red diaper baby, my parents had been CP members before dad joined the army or was drafted in the army after the war. Um, but uh, Howard was a, a, a great, uh, he must have been a great father figure uh, to you and, and, to, and to so many of us. My father took me to the March on Washington, uh, August 28th, 1963. Were you there with your father, I would think? I was there. Um, I was there, but my father wasn't there. Where was he? I don't know. But you were there. Well, we were there I, together. And I was uh, there. I was there with friends. I was, uh, yeah, it was... It was uh, an amazing event, as as everyone knows. I have a picture of, uh, of Dr. King. Actually, I have one right here, but I have a picture of, of him speaking. And, and in the crowd, I say, that's right there is where my father and I were, because I remember <laughs> we're under that tree. Um, but my, my first encounter with your father, I mean, I read about him and he's going to Hanoi and it's writing for the nation and so forth. But in I, I remember so vividly, October 15th, 1969, um, there was a, a rally uh, at the uh, Cambridge Common and on the Boston Common. And we did some uh, excerpts from The Cradle Rock, which was uh, uh, mm. in process in the second second production in Boston <laughs> after Leonard Bernstein's in 39. Mine was in 69. And um, Howard spoke on the, on, the, on the Boston Common. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I know it's a radical thing to say, but you're not supposed to say radical things. But who owns the city of Boston? Is it the tenants or the landlords? And he just exploded and the place exploded with him. And, and uh, I said to myself, this is the message of the Cradle Rock. This is the same thing. So I, I wanted to know, was this speech of his uh, recorded or is there a, a script for it? And I called him and he said, no, it was all extemporaneous. But, but WTBS, MIT recorded it. I was working at WHRB at the time. TBS sent a feed over to HRB. So I, I taped it and I transcribed it and I put it in the program for the Cradle of Rock. And when Howard came opening night, there was his speech or a large portion of his speech in the program. And he was delighted and I was delighted, thrilled to have him there. Uh, that was my first encounter with him. The second one was uh, just two years later, I was doing uh, the American premiere of, uh, or the, the, yeah, the English language premiere of, of Days of the Commune at Sanders Theater. And I asked Howard if he would play 
Dela Cluz, which who, who was the 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 communard who was torn who was torn between violence and nonviolence uh, in the days of the commune, and he looked at it and and he 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 agreed to consider it, but then he turned it down. And, and in fact, I asked Noam Chomsky if he would be in the show too, and they both turned it down. But they were both there uh, on March seventeenth, nineteen seventy one. Then um, I lost touch with him for a few years. I was in graduate school and I was in Europe. And then I read, uh, I think it was the, um, uh, the uh, Emergency Civil Liberties Committee was having a, 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 a benefit of a performance of his Emma, his play about Emma Goldman. I was in Europe and I read about it and I wrote to him and I said, um, I'd love to see this play. Uh, can you send me a script? And he did, he sent me the script. Um, and then um, uh, uh, he wrote me again. He said, I think I, I, I neglected to send it to you. And he sent it to me a second time. So I had to check it out. Um, and um, I was looking at it and I said, you know, I'd really like to turn this into a, a musical. And he said, great, you know. So I sketched a few songs. Um, I wrote one called Emma about, about ben, ben Reitman and his relationship with, with her. And um, uh, another, one, uh, another one about the Triangle Fire, uh, that, which, which is in there, which later became another opera that I did. But, but Howard, Howard was, was uh, receptive at first, but then he wrote me, frankly, he said, I, about these songs, I, I'm not that enthusiastic. I have to be in, uh, frank with you. And I wrote him back and I said, well, I'm living in Europe now in economic exile. And, uh, Helene, uh, uh, and uh, 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 Emma Goldman was in political exile. And frankly, I said, your play takes Emma up to her exile, up to her deportation to Russia. Um, and I'm identifying with her more in the years after that. So I'm gonna take Living My Life, which is public domain and, and, and make a, another musical out of it. He said, great, you know, do, do, do that. And um, so I was inspired originally by him, but then even more inspired by Emma Goldman after uh, her deportation. And we ended up making a piece called uh, E.G., a musical portrait of Emma Goldman, which was a kind of a, 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 um, a, a, a visa application set to music where all the things that are in his play came back as flashbacks, you know, the, the, the different scenes in, in her life in, in this country. Um, and we did this, we, uh, um, we did it in Berlin on, on May 4th, 1986, the hundredth anniversary of Haymarket. We, we started it there. And then it's had uh, 49 productions in five countries since then. Howard got us a, 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 a performance at BU. He wasn't able to be there, but then we had a performance at Brandeis University and Howard was there he, and, and uh, was photographed with us and was very uh, receptive. And the, 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 uh, um, the, there were very few people at that Brandeis uh, uh, performance, unfortunately. There were only like a half a dozen or so. And, but one of them was a, a fellow who, who later worked for the National uh, uh, Institute for the Humanities um, at, in, in Washington. And he wrote an article about it. And he said, Howard Zinn was there. And he said to, the, to, to the, his fellow students, where the hell were you? You know, and, and, how, and uh, then later, of course, there was, a, there was a PBS special about Emma Goldman. You remember that? Um, it was, it was on, uh, on television. And I called Howard and I said, where is mention of your play? And he said, where is your music? You know, and then we looked at the, credits and we saw the same guy who had been in the audience and written about him and, and the play and uh, uh, had actually funded the PBS uh, uh, special. So I wrote to him and he said, yes, sure enough, I was inspired by you and Howard uh, to, to, to uh, help fund this. So we did have an impact, both of us, on, on Emma Goldman. Now, I, I don't want to take all the, the, everybody else's time, but I'll just mention uh, two, two other very important uh, influences that, that Howard had on me, it's in, uh, not just the Cradle Rock and Emma Goldman, but um, of course his book, uh, The People's okay. History and the very first chapters uh, about Columbus uh, inspired my uh, opera that was commissioned by the Pepin Foundation called New World, an opera about what Columbus did to the quote Indians. And I was very, very proud when the last edition of The People's History of the United States actually mentioned that opera as having been performed on October 12th. It was actually not 1992, it was 1991, but uh, he, he mentioned it and he, Unfortunately, spelled my name wrong. But he did. He he did mention mention the uh, the opera in that last edition. And I was very very proud of that. And then, of course, the other thing that Howard did was uh, uh, Sacco and Vanzetti was he wrote the uh, the forward to the reissue of Boston of Upton Sinclair's novel that's based on Sacco and Vanzetti primary sources. And then he spoke at the December first, nineteen ninety five, National Opera Association convention 
seminar on Sacco and Vanzetti and Mark Blitzstein's Incomplete Opera, which I completed years later. And in, 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 in and, and well, Blitzstein was thinking of the Rosenbergs as he was writing Sacco and Vanzetti. In 2010, for uh, Earl Robinson's centennial, the National Committee to reopen the Rosenberg case, I did a, a, a concert and, uh, and, 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 and we had a whole excerpt on that concert in memory of Howard who had just passed away. We did an excerpt from Emma, uh, the Emma Goldman piece and, and remembered him. And he will always be remembered and treasured in our hearts for so many things and so many inspirations. And uh, Jeff, I just hope that we have, that you will have a little more time to tell us more about him because I've never met you before, but heard about you and uh, always wanted to know more. Uh, and the more you can tell us, the more we will value it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Leonard and, and Jeff. Whoa, why did that happen? Jeff, Jeff would you like to respond there? Why is that um, You've got two mics on, Gene. If you want to mute one of them, you'll be fine. Jeff, are you speaking? Yeah, no. Uh, 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 Jeff, you should just go ahead right now. Okay. No, you're all. I think you're all set, Dean. I think your uh, if your laptop is muted, you'll be fine. Um, I mean, my my own um, involvement with Emma was um, I directed the very first uh, of it at Theater for the New City in New York in 1970 six or seven or something like that. It was the very first thing I ever directed. Um, my father wrote this play. It was the first play he'd ever written. And I was, I, I had studied theater and I was in New York um, as an actor at that time. And he said, Hey, I've written this play. And he uh, showed it to me and I read it. And I, um, and I said, let me, and I was working at the time at Theater for the New City, um, which was run by Crystal Field and George Bartenyev, and it was a very political place. And, and I brought it to George and Crystal, and I said, my dad has written a play. Um, would you, you know, would you let me direct it here? And they said, absolutely. They knew, they knew who he was. They knew him. They knew his work, even this is well before he had achieved the celebrity that came with people's history, but they, they knew him, they knew who he was. And, um, and they said, yeah, absolutely. And um, I, I, I put it on and it, and it was, you know, it's a monster. There's, there's uh, 12 actors playing 30 characters and as written, it had, um, a lot of images and music and we had three slide projectors set up and these were like the old fashioned carousel projectors. So, you know, not the way we do that today is with computers and, you know, it's all, it's much easier to make it work. Um, but, and, and uh, there were masks involved because in the, there were these scenes and there's a scene where uh, the collective of, radicals and revolutionaries attempt an assassination of Henry Clay Frick. And so it starts with this board meeting with all these fat cats sitting around and they were all wearing uh, these wonderful masks that had been created by uh, someone who was in the cast named Jared Sacrin, who had, who had gone to Juilliard and he was actually a specialist in mask and, um, Anyway, um, so it was it, when it, when it was all done, and it was it, it was really wonder, well received. And uh, Harold Clerman, who had known Emma Goldman, actually came to see the show, uh, and I remember him walking down Jane Street with his fedora and his cape and his cane after seeing it. And uh, but when it was all done, I was so exhausted from this experience of directing this epic 
I, I was, I, I don't think I directed anything again for another three or four years. I'd had enough. It was, it was too much work. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, and then it was done in Boston at the, uh, the uh, next move company mounted it. Uh, Maxine Klein directed it and, and they, they mounted it as a, a kind of a, as a commercial enterprise and it ran for a year in Boston um, and it had another outing in New York off Broadway uh, with David Wheeler directing it. Um, and that ran for, you know, I, I don't know how many performances, but it's not often produced because it's so big. It's a, it's not an easy play. Uh, it's not an easy play to, to put on. Is there um, a video of it to watch, Jeff? Excuse me? Is there a video that one can watch of it? Um, the, there, there's a video... The, the, there was a video of a production of it that was done that my sister Myla sent me, but it's basically just a taping of, of the live performance. And so it's not, um, and I'm, I, I don't think it's, you know, uh, I don't think it's available for, for general viewing. Um, so the answer, the answer really is no. Can it be posted and made available? I, I'm I'm not sure. I'll I'll talk to Milo about it and ask her if that. I would love to see it. Having read it, I, I've never seen it though. Yeah, yeah. You you you, you, met, you mentioned that your father um, was the same person in public as in private. Emma Goldman was not. Ellie Sigmeister, who came to our performance and knew her in Paris, and he said that, you know, when she talked, she, she had this public persona and she started mm -hmm. like FDR. And in private, she was not a, a Jewish mother. She made chicken soup and matzo ball. You know, and, 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 and that, that was really a, a, a big difference between Emma Goldman and Howard Zinn, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. We would like to do a shout out to the Zinn Education Project which is just a remarkable project. If you're not on their mailing list, um, you should be. They, they send out these emails that are basically sort of um, study guides for teachers um, to, to teach about the real history of the United States and the history of, of the planet and capitalism. And um, it, it's, it's just great to get those emails and you can support them uh, with your contributions. It's, it's just such a wonderful antidote to the likes of, uh, of what's that Florida governor, Ron DeSantis. CRT is illegal in Florida. Um, it's, it's almost as, as stupid as uh, Pinochet um, uh, saying that folk music is illegal in Chile, uh, or you know, it's like God bless the grass that grows through the cracks, um, and and it grows thanks to thanks to Howard and the Zen Education Project. Um, I I wonder if did, did you mention to me that there's somebody on the on the Zoom YouTube on, on the YouTube? Okay, okay, so um, they. You can't um, get on and make any comments uh, if you're on YouTube, not on the, on, on the Zoom. But um, that's such a marvelous um, uh, organization that I follow very carefully, and I'm grateful for, for the work they do. There's also Dave Zirin, who I believe is writing a biography, if I'm not mistaken. And um, we would love to get him to, to speak once that biography comes out. He's, he's a sports writer for the nation. And um, um, we have not been able to, to uh, book Dave to, to speak, but we'll keep trying and um, getting more and more ambitious on, on who, we, who we invite, um, sort of in the, in the tradition of our minister for 40 years, Donald Lothrop, uh, it just just kind of uh, we have no money, but we're this we're this church, and we uh, um, have this really incredible history. And uh, would you like to join us sometime? And sometimes they say yes, uh, like like Howard did over and over and over again. Um, is there anybody else who would like to to join us? There was one person who said I was I was one of Howard's teaching assistants. Susan Mursky. Susan Mursky. 
Um, would you like to join us, Susan, and uh, say hello? Surely. I, no, I was not the person who was a teaching assistant. That was someone else. I, I know not who. But I did say that I would be most happy to uh, join and say hello to you, Jeff, and uh, just to relate, uh, I was a student at Boston University from 1962 to 66 and had the great pleasure of having your father as a professor who uh, really helped uh, move my life along. Uh, although all of that that he he taught was absolutely within me from my my background, but um, he was so helpful uh, in helping us organize our student movement at BU, and then of course uh, with the anti-war and Vietnam War activities, he was uh, incredibly helpful. Uh, he was supportive when we sat in at the federal building in, uh, in Boston. Uh, and then later, I, I, incarnation, I ended up uh, moving to Newton. And I was so pleased to, uh, to know that he was there and uh, he helped us organize our Newton Dialogues on Peace and War. I, I, I also, uh, both he and your mother stood at our weekly vigil, I, which was absolutely wonderful uh, in Newton Center. That was great. I also, at one period of time, my son, who was just starting college, uh, came to, um, a, to the local meeting at uh, Frieda Rebelsky's house. I don't know if you knew, remember her. Yes, and um, your father spoke. And my son had been interested in history, but listening to your father, he decided that that was going to be the path of his life. And he spoke with your father, and I think they exchanged some um, correspondence. But he then did become a history teacher and used the people's history as a textbook for his work. And I just want to echo you know, stuff, something that uh, you brought out, which was uh, not only was what he said so important, uh, but it was his humanity uh, in both working with students and working with uh, organizers uh, on, a, on a larger level and on an interpersonal level. So uh, thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Susan. That, that's really lovely. Very nice to see you and, and um, hear what you, what you had to say. Lovely. Here's a, a moment to tell you about a, a little of what's coming up here. Um, uh, January 15th, we have uh, a new beloved uh, participant. Her name is Letta Neely. Just so happens she is also a, a, a teacher. She was, she was my son's teacher in seventh grade at the uh, Mission Hill School. And she's just an inspiring voice. Uh, she's, um, her talk is on MLK Day, Remembering Dr. Martin Luther King. And that day we have Falani Haynes, 82-year-old jazz singer uh, from Dorchester and, uh, and her incredible jazz accompanist named Michael Shea. Um, the week after that, we have uh, another BU professor. His name is Jim Ifland. He teaches um, uh, Latin American literature at Boston University. And he's, he's written a book about Roque Dalton, who is the Salvadoran poet who was, who was um, murdered in the late 70s. Uh, and but left a, a huge legacy of, of politics and poetry. The week after that, we have Professor Richard Wolf, um, always a very, very popular speaker for us and for uh, his major presence on YouTube, Richard Wolf. Um, after that, we have 
on February 5th uh, program. I'm really looking forward to it. It's a follow up to our our Holy Land Foundation Sacco and Manzetti Award. It's um, members of the Coalition for Civil Freedoms who represent political prisoners, especially Arab Muslim political prisoners who were who were caught in the uh, post 9-11 dragnet. And um, it, there's several speakers who will be with us that day and, and, and witnesses of what happened to them. That's uh, February 5th. February 12th, another Boston University friend. His name is Ravi Roldan Figueroa. Uh, Ravi is a professor of theology at, at Boston University. And he was very interested in community churches sanctuary program in the 80s. And uh, he did a study of, of it. He came and, and went through all our archives. I've just now this morning found some more tapes of Manuel, who was our um, who was uh, in sanctuary here from Guatemala. He was a physician uh, fleeing political oppression in, in Guatemala during those horrible times of genocide uh, by the, the, the US-backed military in Guatemala. Um, Radi will be telling us about sanctuary in the 80s, the movement in a lot, of, a lot of churches, and also connecting it with the present sanctuary movement, which is about people who are, who are um, seeking refuge from ICE deportation and detention. Um, Radi Roldan and February 22nd. February 22nd. More, more, more great stuff. Uh, a, a screening, uh, January 21st, we have a screening of, 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 a, of a movie that's called Los Hermanos. It's about two world class uh, Cuban musicians, um, uh, the brothers uh, Lopez Gavilan. Aldo is a pianist, he lives in Havana, and his brother Ilmar is a violinist, lives in New York, and they have hard time performing together, even though they're, they're world class. You know, we're talking um, metropolitan, uh, uh, we're talking major symphony players, both of them, and composers. And we'll, we'll screen that film. Also another film in, in February, which is uh, the Al Jazeera film documentary about the Holy Land Foundation Five uh, that we are just hungry to learn more about and, uh, and uh, champion their cause of, of being freed. Um, much more will be heard about that. Um, so uh, that's a little bit of, of what's coming up. I wonder if there's anybody here in, in the room physically who would like to um, talk about Howard or, or say hello to Jeff. Um, yes, we have two hands up. You want to come up here and, and sit in this chair? I'm sorry, I don't have a, um, a cordless mic to take to you. No, no, it's, it's this oh. one up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell us your name first. <laughs> My name is Mary, and I have been a teacher for over 30 years. So it's really helpful to hear about the um, structure of the Edward, uh, of education, which um, is necessary because, frankly, most of us have realized with a bit of a shock that this current generation knows almost nothing about any talking about. Uh, so the question is about Jeff to you about did you as a family like I did live with part of my family who was spearheading internal medicine at Johns Hopkins and we had wonderful talks you know around the dinner table very very busy people the, pa the fathers were uh, but that was always brought up for example when there would be a conference then he'd come back and he'd bring some anecdotes and and um, it was part of life to extend beyond just the daily uh, good and bad. <laughs> so that I really appreciate having you mentioned the John the um, something like a teaching guide, extremely needed. Uh, education in Boston, in particular, has totally been discarded in terms of relevance. Uh, and the uh, numbness of the drugs uh, is taking our children away from engagement and 
and discussion of such things. But we did have dinner time table things that were talked about that stuck and then we followed up. We went, we would go to occasionally something age appropriate. So I appreciate that. And I wonder whether or not you have more news. You mentioned a couple of the, of the people that were teachers as well, but that's a play um, that could be too age appropriate to be entered into it. something like bread and papa theater which I have gone to and enjoyed um, and learned from. So that's the question, Jeff. Was that happening with your crowd? <laughs> yes, many, many, many discussions at dinner time, uh, political and, and otherwise. Um, you know, everything I know about politics and, and uh <clears throat> political science, if you will. Um, I learned by osmosis um, at the dinner table and, and elsewhere. Uh, I didn't, I, I didn't uh, go into that field, if you, you know, as it were. Um, but uh, I feel like I soaked it up as I went along. We have Cheney Ryan who would like to join us. Uh, would you unmute Cheney and say hello to us? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm the person who was Howard's uh, teaching assistant, so I thought I'd uh, chime in. Um, first of all, uh, thanks so much for, for doing this. And uh, I've been Facebook friends with Jeff for some time, but never actually heard him talk about this or, or met him, so it's been great. Um, I, I was um, uh, Howard's teaching assistant in the early 1970s, and I, I suppose uh, his unique impact on me is I'm a, a university professor. Um, I was at the University of Oregon, excuse me, for many years, um, and then I moved to Oxford University where I am now and I actually run uh, the human rights programs for Oxford University, so I live in England most of the time, uh, though I'm, I'm calling now from the United States. Um, I was um, expelled from Harvard University for political activities, uh, protesting the Vietnam War, uh, and I actually was completely disillusioned with higher education. Um, but at a certain point after working, quite frankly, as a dishwasher for a while, uh, I started to think, well, maybe I want to be back in school. Um, but I had no respect for any of my faculty uh, teachers at Harvard. But I had, I had uh, met Howard, uh, and also I knew some of the other people there. I, I'm in the philosophy department, not the politics department. Um, but I went and I talked to Howard and a few other people, and I said, well, maybe I can continue my education at Boston University. So that's how I ended up at Boston University. Um, and I was able to do my graduate work without ever having a bachelor's degree. And that was something that Howard helped worked out because I didn't want to go back to Harvard and get it. I felt that was uh, something I wanted to do. So I was indebted to him for that. Uh, and I was indebted to him for giving me a model of how you could be a principled academic. I didn't believe it, quite frankly, before then. Um, and I should say they were eventful years at Boston University. Uh, there was a fascist named John Silber, who was the president of the university. So there were endless conflicts. And uh, uh, Howard and I were arrested together at one point and spent much of the evening together in jail for a uh, event that occurred at BU. Uh, I moved to the West Coast in the mid 70s. I got a teaching job. And so I stayed in touch with Howard and I would see him uh, pretty, pretty regularly. And, and as I said, I mean, uh, I, 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 he gave me uh, the belief that um, uh, you could be an academic and be principled and be an activist, which, which was not something that, uh, that I'd had models of before. I, I suppose the only other anecdote which sticks in my mind, other than the sort of inspirational ones that people have, is uh, I remember having breakfast with him. <clears throat> I don't really remember where it was, but I remember having breakfast with him. Uh, and uh, he said, well, let me pay for this, Cheney. 
And I said, oh, that's that's great, Howard. And he said, yeah. He said, well, my book, The People's History, is doing really well now. So I have more money than I used to. And we laughed. We laughed about that because, um, among other things, they never paid him much at Boston University. But that was, I think, the first time I realized what an impact the people's history was having because it was not I was in higher education. It was, I think, mainly mainly in high schools it was being used as it should have been. So anyway, uh, it, it was great to be a teaching assistant for him. I did it for a year, basically. Uh, it was a course on uh, law and justice. Uh, John Terman was one of the other uh, teaching assistants at the time, is now still very active in Boston. So anyway, uh, thanks for doing this. It's really been wonderful to listen. And it's been great to hear Jeff talk about his family, who I, I remember him and I remember Howard and Roz very, very well. So thank you. Thank you. Janie, which event uh, were you expelled for from Harvard? Was it uh, the April 69 bust? Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I mean, as, as you may remember, Leonard, there, there were quite a lot of people that were expelled. It was no great distinction. Uh, and, and I, but I'll be frank with you, I didn't care at the time. Um, in fact, they had a hearing about it. And I not only didn't go, I, I forgot when it was being held to determine what my fate was. Uh, I think uh, my main worry, I'm sure you understand, my main worry was what to do about the Vietnam War. Uh, because uh, I, at the time, if you lost your student deferment, then you were, you were draft eligible. Uh, and that's a whole other story that actually took about a year to, to work out. Um, but I really was completely disillusioned with higher education. I, I didn't respect any of my professors at Harvard. Uh, so I didn't think I wanted to do that anymore. Uh, and, and that was why Howard, that was probably the single greatest impact he had on me, was give a, a unique model of how you could, you could be a principled academic activist. And uh, uh, it's probably res it accounts for what I do now, which is I, let me, if I can put in a plug for what I do, I, I, run, I run workshops out of Oxford, but most of them happen in the United States, actually, and they're on issues of human rights. We're doing one next week uh, in Sonoma, California, on human rights and activism. So what we do is we, we use the Oxford connection to bring people from an international perspective, but also we, we, we very much focus on American problems. So it's, it's, as Howard said, it's internationalism, trying to get the international perspective. All of that is due to, uh, to the influence of Howard uh, on me. So anyway, thanks again. Thank you, Cheney. And, and uh, we do stay in touch with us. Uh, it's, it's great to hear from you uh, from across the pond. And, um, and, uh, and next we'll have David Rothhauser and then we have um, somebody in the, in the audience. David, go ahead. Hi. Hello, uh, uh, everyone. Um, uh, my uh, uh, introduction to Howard uh, was uh, maybe a little different than a lot of people. I had um, already been a peace activist, uh, if you want to call it that. I don't like labels very much. Um, but anyway, I've been writing poetry and plays and uh, demonstrating in various ways um, since 1960. Uh, in, New, in Europe and in New York. And I came to Boston in uh, 1971 to study filmmaking. And uh, I, I heard about Howard. Um, and uh, at the same time, I heard about Noam Chomsky. But in those days, uh, for some reason, uh, I, I, I never um, put anyone on a pedestal of for any reason at all. It's just something I didn't do. Uh, so I didn't idolize Howard or, or Noam Chomsky or anything. These are people who were active in the uh, peace movement, and I was interested in them, but uh, I didn't hold them at any higher level. In any case, um, uh, Howard, I, I believe he came to a play that I was performing in uh, called The Trial of Sapon Vanzetti, and later on I found out that, that he had been there, but I, I didn't know him at that time. But um, Little different things happened with him. For example, while I was at, uh, while I was a student at uh, BU, um, a Russian uh, uh, 
student, a graduate student came to Boston and for some reason, someone introduced him to me and, uh, and told him that I would introduce him uh, to Howard. And uh, this guy was a, uh, he was a communist and, uh, and I'd heard that Howard uh, might've been a communist or something like that. In any case, I called up Howard and, uh, and, I, and we had known each other enough so that I could talk with Howard openly. And, uh, and I said, uh, there's this guy from uh, <laughs> Soviet Union wants to meet you. Would you mind talking with him? And Howard said, oh yeah, bring him over. So I brought him over to Howard's office and uh, uh, they started talking about politics. I did not participate. I just sat there and, uh, and, I, and, and in no time, uh, Howard got angry at the guy and he started uh, yelling at him about being a communist. And, uh, and it, wasn't, it didn't become confrontational, it just became sort of argumentative. And, um, and that's one thing I remember about that particular issue. That evolved later on when I was directing a play in the North End um, uh, 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 called the, the um, about Oppenheimer, uh, the uh, famous play about, uh, about Oppenheimer. And um, I was directing it at a, a theater called the Nucleo Cletico Theater on Hanover Street. <clears throat> and uh, I invited uh, Howard to come and speak uh, at the opening uh, performance of uh, In the Matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer. And, uh, and Howard agreed to do that. And uh, so I was preparing it and the um, artistic director at the time uh, who did not do political plays and would have nothing to do with political plays. But uh, because I was uh, a uh, manager of the that particular uh, theater, uh, he agreed to let me do the play. But when he heard that I had invited uh, Howard to come and talk, he uh, he instantly uh, he said, "I won't have Howard Zinn come and talk at this theater." He said, "I will close the theater before I will allow Howard to come and talk." And I said, "Look, I've already invited Howard, and Howard agreed to come, so let's let's do it." And he said, "I'm telling you now," he said, "I'm closing the theater if if he, if Howard steps into that door." So I was in, a, in a, a terrible position, but I called up Howard and I told him what was going on. And Howard said, keep doing the play. And I said, well, he's gonna close the theater. It, and Howard got angry about that uh, because he'd already agreed to come. And I understood what he was going through, uh, but I, I really didn't know what to do about it. I could have I stood up for Howard made it a political issue and the theater would have closed because the guy, the uh, artistic director had that power and, uh, and he would have done it. And uh, so unfortunately, uh, Howard couldn't, uh, could not come to do that. Uh, later on uh, at the Community Church of Boston, I, was, I had the honor of introducing uh, Howard as a, uh, a, 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 at the uh, annual Sacco and Vanzetti Award that he was awarded in, I think it was 1991, if I'm not mistaken. And, and so uh, I, I had that honor. And, and the best thing about Howard that I remember is that I learned from him. Uh, I learned from him. And we did things together politically uh, and also uh, 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 creatively. And uh, at uh, different places, but at, in, in particular at the Dante Alighieri Society at different Sacco and Vanzetti uh, commemoration events. Um, but Howard, I learned from Howard and I learned that he was more than what people often uh, labeled him as, uh, being a uh, peace activist, anti-war activist, political scientist, he was more than that. He understood the human condition on every level. And that was the beauty of Howard. And he was creative. Uh, every time he spoke, he was a creative person. He wasn't just somebody spouting off rhetoric. 
And uh, that was the beauty of Howard. And I, you know, I, I feel honored to be a part of that from an, uh, a friendly point of view. So anyway, that's my memory of Howard. Thank you. We'd like to welcome uh, Sean. Are you first time here, Sean? Yeah, first time here. Well, welcome, welcome. And I like your Hat People's Forum. I, I, I oh, saw yeah, your hat, I, I, I was oh. like, I think I saw that on the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so welcome. Yeah. Go ahead. Right, so I have a question for Jeff and anybody else here, since we're um, committing the cardinal sin of talking about um, Howard Zinn and also his friends Chomsky, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on a great American, you know, left-wing writers uh, and their legacy, I was wondering if um, Howard uh, ever had a relationship with Michael Brenton, who uh, is famous for books like Flashers and Reds, Against Empire. Um, Parenti, I think, has, if not cited, definitely mentioned Howard's in, in his lectures multiple times. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if there is. Any what, what's the last name again? Parenti. It's parent with an I at the end. I I'm I don't know. Okay. A anybody else here? Here, um, Parenti. He's spoken here, um, especially in the '80s, in the early '90s, oh, and, yeah. and we have cassettes of of his his work. Is he still alive? Uh, yeah, but he doesn't do lectures anymore. Okay. Oh man, I, I will be here for those lectures. <laughs> well, uh, they're 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 on cassette, mm -hmm. uh, among an, another like two thousand other cassettes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he spoke a number of times here. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. And now, go ahead, Faye. Good morning or good afternoon by now. Unmute, Faye. Hmm. I was a student. Uh, oh, thank you, uh, Jeff Zinn, for coming. I was a student uh, at Boston University in the 60s uh, when Howard Zinn was a professor. And I tried to get into his class, but it was full, surprisingly. And, uh, <laughs> and um, so I didn't go. And I found out many years later that he let everybody into the class, whether there was room or not, and um, but I I was shy and and I didn't do things like that. Even though I would go to uh, demonstrations at the at the student center uh, against Roxy organizing on campus uh, for the Vietnam War and uh, and things like that. I, I mean, it was active. So. What I did because I couldn't get into his class was I, uh, I went to everything where he spoke uh, because he, he uh, if you couldn't go to him, he would come to you. Uh, that's the way it was. He had teach-ins all the time. Uh, there were so many opportunities to hear him for many, many, many years. Uh, I, I would see him in restaurants sitting by himself drinking coffee sometimes or uh, uh, he, uh, I remember uh, there was a, a film of Slaughterhouse Five at the Brattle, and he showed up to uh, introduce it. And it was a, a rainy Wednesday night, and there was almost nobody there, but he came anyway um, because he thought it was important, and it was. Um, uh, the bombing of Dresden, that is. I just wanted to tell one story that I remember. Um, I remember being in the castle at Boston University where the dean held court. And, uh, and Howard Zinn was there. There were several people there. Uh, you know, I was shy. I kind of stayed away from everybody. But what I remember was, my, what I remember from that event was, there was a picture of cluster bombs being used in Vietnam at the time. And, <clears throat> and there was a picture of uh, children uh, uh, having napalm dropped on them. And, and he was there, but he just didn't, he wasn't a celebrity, 
you know, he was there, but he was there to teach us. And that, and so I, what I remember is what he taught. Uh, he was a very um, unimposing person that way. Um, and that's what a great teacher is, is where the, the, what they're telling you is more important than who they are as a celebrity. And I, I just wanted to say that I, uh, I think of him as my father. Um, I don't think you can have too many fathers in this world. I mean, my father was fine, but I, I think of Howard Zinn as my father, just the way he would speak to us like a father, um, in, um, just, just like we were sitting at the table with him. And uh, so thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to tell folks that Faye Strigler is uh, our most recent, newest <laughs> member of Community Church of Boston. Uh, just signed our, our beautiful membership book, which has about 40 years worth of, of signatures. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member of this of this place, um, you can be, um, what's the word, um, uh, polygamous, you can belong to another church and and belong here. It's it's about just getting interested in what it is we're, uh, we want to do here and how we manage this building, who we have as tenants, what kind of events that we do here, and, and also have a voice in this program and, and, um, and deciding what our program will be uh, in, in the months and the years upcoming, helping us with the archives, um, uh, helping us with, with events and receptions and uh, like the amazing one that we just did for all these folks that, that, that were involved in the Sacro Manzetti event in, in December. Um, uh, it was, we had a reception for uh, a, a very wonderful a small group of, of Palestine activists who were, who were with us to, to receive Miko and Nida Abu Bakr, who was the daughter of, of, of one of the Holy Land Foundation folks. Anyway, I'm going on and on, and Hi, there's a gentleman named Larry Sr. who would like to join us. Welcome, Larry. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just uh, came on to this. Uh, I was checking emails, and I saw the name Jeff Zinn, and I first heard of Howard Zinn, actually, when he passed away. And it was a high school classmate of mine who has been a, a reporter and, and so on and has written a couple of books. Um, and I respect her greatly. And so that caused me to uh, look a little more into Howard Zinn. And uh, Jeff, uh, are you familiar with Dr. Bernard Lown? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I, I absolutely. I, I was classmates with his son Freddie uh, oh, yeah. at Newton High. Fred was, I don't know, a year, maybe a year ahead of me, maybe, maybe one or two more. But anyway, yes, I know the Lowndes, and I, and of course, Doctor Lown was my father's cardiologist as well as. Mm -hmm his colleague in, in peace activism yes. for many, many years, um, neighbors in Newton, et cetera, et cetera. Why do you ask? Well, I, I uh, uh, in 2008, I was the mayor of Lewiston, Maine. Oh. And Dr. Lown was a 1938 graduate of Lewiston High School. Hmm. And uh, we, uh, advanced an, an effort to name a bridge, which was simply called the South Bridge. It, it, it really was just referred to as the South Bridge. It wasn't a, an official name. Uh, to name it the Bernard Lown Peace Bridge. And so uh, I, uh, a, a friend of mine, I was uh, officiating at uh, Bates College uh, track meets and a friend of mine who was also volunteering there uh, told me about Dr. Lown. And he said, I've been trying to have different politicians try to name the South Bridge in his honor. So I, uh, 
I took the information and then I called. Uh, I didn't know if he was this man was still alive or, or what. Uh, I knew he had to be elderly. Uh, and so I called, he had gone to the University of Maine. So I called the alumni and uh, they gave me his address and phone number. So I called and uh, Mrs. Lown answered. And I said, I didn't know if Dr. Lown was still alive. <laughs> I said, may I speak to Dr. Lown? She said, just a moment. So that's when I asked him if he would uh, uh, allow us uh, to name the South Bridge between Lewiston and Auburn, Twin Cities, uh, in his honor. And he said, I would be honored. And uh, as a result, we became good friends. So I know Fred, I know Naomi, I know Ann. And in the summer, when he'd come up to Sebago Lake, they would invite us and he's been to our home and so on. So. But I also am a member of Veterans for Peace. And Veterans for Peace has an award, the Howard Zinn Lifetime Achievement Award. <laughs> and I nominated Dr. Lown, and he was awarded the, uh, the, uh, the Howard Zinn Lifetime Achievement Award. And uh, he was uh, sickly at the time. He was sitting out on his patio, but he's holding the award. And uh, Anne sent me the, the, the photo of that. But also Howard Zinn wrote the foreword for Dr. Lown's book, uh, A Prescription's uh, Physician to End Nuclear Madness. And uh, so, uh, of course, I, I always I gain more interest in Howard Zinn. I listened to some of his uh, talks. And when I saw the name Jeff Zinn, I didn't know he had a son. So that caused me to come on to this uh, today. So uh, um, so I became friends with the Lown family as well. What's your last name, Larry Sr.? Larry Gilbert. Larry Gilbert Sr. Uh, well, actually, this is the, Lenny, proper, uh, the proper name is Laurent, L-A-U-R-E-N-T, which is French for Lawrence. And I'm a first generation American. My parents were from, born in Quebec province. This is Lenny up in Maine. I just wanted to say I drove over that bridge a few weeks ago. I was going, wow, I didn't know they named a Bridge after Dr. Lown. Oh, I. Uh, what's the name, Lenny? I'll have to look for your photo here. Lenny is. Uh, Lenny. <laughs> Lenny Shames. Up. Oh, I'm on phone right now. I was oh, on yeah. video before. I see. Lenny lives in Brunswick. Uh, we also have. Uh, speaking of being Dean, I wonder if I can just break in for a moment. I'm. I'm. In, I'm going to uh, break in uh, my own action here. Main, uh, this is Alan. All over the place. Yes, go I, ahead, Alan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I've been listening to this. Uh, I, I'm on the phone also, uh, headed for church, actually. Uh, but I, I want to, I'm hoping that, Dean, that, that there's no real rush to end this, this wonderful service today. Um, it, you know, of course, it's up to you. Uh, but if there are people that are waiting, not that haven't had a chance to speak yet, that want to, I, I hope we can just hang out until everybody gets a chance to say whatever they'd like. And I, but I realize, Jeff, of course, you may have to leave and whatever. It's fine if you do. Um, but anyway, I did want to just make a comment and a question for you, Jeff, also. Um, I, I never saw Howard speak in person. I saw I saw him many recordings of him in, in uh, audio and the film, a couple film things. Um, uh, and uh, you had mentioned that you know, he was like the same person in uh, in public as in private, and I that's that's a, just a wonderful wonderful news. I, I I think I sort of assumed that, but I it's it's really nice to hear that. And um uh and and, and you talked like you said he had no dark side, and that that caused caused me to consider you know the not so much a dark side of a personality, but a the 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 darkness that that many of us most of us know. And and the darkness that that motivates us to to remove it and fix it and and work towards the light and so on, 
And um, so this last November, uh, last Labor Day, uh, Democracy Now!, Amy Goodman and her team put together this fabulous tribute to, to your dad um, uh, about Howard. And, uh, and he, it also talked quite a bit about the, um, the new version of the people's histories. I think the people's history of the United States for young people or something like that. And um, but anyway, in the series of interviews that uh, Democracy Now! aired in, in Labor Day, this past Labor Day, uh, I encourage people to search it out. But he talks about some of the motivations he had caused by his experience in World War II and the killing that he performed, you know, as a, as a bombardier. And um, I've heard him touch on that history quite a bit, actually, fairly frequently, but not so much talking about like the deep feelings and the, and the remorse and the, the sense of, um, you know, the need to make amends or reparations type of thing. And um, I just wonder if you could, you can comment on that. Um, uh, I also just throw, you know, you know, um, I wonder if, if um, um, like, he, uh, I, I was wondering if he knew like Fidel Castro is one of the famous people, <laughs> uh, but also like Phil Berrigan, Phil Berrigan also was, bombing in world war ii and I, I was wondering if there was a connection there as well and 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 you know the the real some of the things that really motivated him like that and, and how he addressed the, the darkness that he knew about those those evils so thank you um thank you um well as far as berrigan goes they were great friends and in fact my my father and dan berrigan and uh traveled to North Vietnam um, at the request of the North Viet not the North Vietnamese government for a prisoner exchange. Um, and they they traveled to Hanoi and they received, you know, these these uh, American prisoners of war were handed over to my dad and and Father Berrigan. Um, and brought back to the United States. And of course, the American military promptly, you know, took them uh, out of out of their uh, orbit and and uh, debrief them and did whatever they do. Um, I don't think my father ever met or knew uh, Fidel Castro. Um, I, I, I I'll take I'll take an opportunity to mention that because someone I forget uh, mentioned in passing something about whether my dad was a communist or not and how he reacted angrily to someone that he was he was speaking with. Um, it, it's it's actually repeated way too often, usually in the right wing media that Howard's in the communist, uh, blah blah blah, you know, party member. My father was not a member of the Communist Party. Um, he, it, by the time uh, he came of age, um, which you know, the um, you know the dark side of Stalinism was more than apparent, and uh, he uh, he he was not interested in in being a member of the party per se. Um, he was certainly a Marxist, um, and he wrote a wonderful one-man show called Marx and Soho um, about Karl Marx and uh, kind of bringing Marx to life. Um, and uh, and as far as as far as you know, the dark side. I mean, I think that was one of the things that kind of, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> set my father apart from many people on the left, which is that he had a kind of uh, indefatigable optimism that as dark as things ever got, um, he always uh, kind of, you know, saw the, the, the possibilities of activism and um, that, that I mean, that was really his mantra that uh, the actions of individuals can really make a difference. And that's why my, you know, some 
someone mentioned um, his participation in a in a vigil in Newton Center, you know, standing out on a street corner in Newton Center. And he did the same thing in um, uh, Wellfleet, which, you know, I live on Cape Cod and we I lived in Wellfleet for many years. And um, every year on Hiroshima Day, there there would be a vigil in front of town hall. And you think, well, what difference does it make whether someone stands out on a street corner you know, in a vigil and, you know, people are driving by, you know, and couldn't care less. And, you know, that, that was very much uh, part of my dad's philosophy. It's just, yeah, you show up and you, mm -hmm. um, you, you know, you, you vote with your feet and with your voice and uh, not so much with your vote. He was not a big believer in electoral politics. <laughs> that's another. That's another story. Um, he, for instance, he was not uh, a, a big fan of. Uh, uh, he he supported uh, Ralph Nader, um, and it wasn't until after the horrors of the Iraq War and the the whole you know, the consequences of electing George W. Bush to the White House, that he reluctantly uh, came around to the idea that, no, it actually does make a difference. Mm -hmm. And he supported a, a little bit reluctantly, a little bit unenthusiastically, but he supported Obama um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in his in his uh, in his for in the 2008 election of course he died my dad died in uh 2010 so that that was that was the end of it he had no inkling of of uh, what was to follow <laughs> anyway i hope that answers your questions could, could i just chime in for a moment jeff on the theme what your father said something i found about <laughs> David Rothhauser here. Oh, I'm sorry. David, go ahead. Gene? Uh, yes, um, I, I just, uh, uh, to uh, Jeff, I, I, I was the person who mentioned that uh, the idea of uh, Howard being a communist, it wasn't my idea, it, it was things that I heard from other people. And uh, the Russian uh, graduate student who came and for some reason, uh, someone introduced him to me to introduce to Howard. And I have no connection with Howard being a communist at all or, or anything like that. Uh, later on, when I directed the play in the matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer, and the artistic director said, I won't have Howard come to this theater. He's a communist. And I, I said, it doesn't matter to me. I invited him and, and uh, I want, you know, he should be allowed to speak. But as I told you before, they uh, threatened to shut down the theater and they, they would have. And, and just, it just put me in a very bad position. And, and then again, put Howard in a bad position because he had already agreed. But um, going back to uh, the whole idea, I'd never had the idea that Howard was a communist. I knew he was interested in Marxist-Leninist philosophy, but beyond that, uh, nothing like, like Well, me. there's nothing wrong with being a communist. Um, <laughs> let's get that out of the way. Right. Um, and there, there would be nothing wrong. I mean, the Communist Party is, you know, it's like the Democratic Party or the Republican, it's a party, right? You're allowed to join parties in this country. Um, it just happens to be a piece of misinformation that has kind of gone out into the ether and uh, I think needs to be corrected. That's why I brought it up. I wasn't, a, and, I got, and I got that when you said that, that it wasn't something that you had said, but something that you had heard. Gene, can I make a comment? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Mary Lynn. Thank you. I don't have a hand thing on this. Um, uh, just a quick comment that 
I had always wanted to um, uh, thank Howard for being the only radical academician that I knew that knew who Paul Maddock was. And he actually mentioned him in his book. And I don't know if you know who he was, but I put everything I owned into my VW bug back in 1972 and drove out here to study with a Paul Maddock. It turned out it was with his son, but he um, actually, he's written many books and he's probably the most leftist <laughs> council communist I know. He's certainly not accepted by the sort of monthly review neo-Keynesian kind of um, communism or, or Marxist. But I wondered if you um, knew who Paul was I and met, I studied with him. Go I ahead, met, go ahead. I met Paul. Um, if, if, no, if Paul I'm, or Paul? Paul is the father and Paul's the son. I knew, I think I knew, I think it was the son who, who I knew. Um, yeah. Who, uh, did you know the son? I studied with Paul, the son. I came here to study with Paul because a longshoreman in San Diego told me if I really wanted to understand capitalism and economics, I needed to come out to uh, Cambridge because he thought it was be the father. But nevertheless, Paul, father was very present in all the work we were doing and Ilsa Maddox was teaching at Wheelock. Um, so they were the most radical um, of the communists that I that I ever knew, but it was council communism. But um, Marx and Keynes is one more popular book that Powell, the father, wrote it felt the same way. Um, but there are, he wrote many books, but um, Hard was the only radical academician I knew that even knew who Powell was. Well, Paul's son was, yeah. I, I believe, a friend of my sister's, and he made a big impression on me because he had a motorcycle. Um, <laughs> and uh, and he, he told me something about, about riding motorcycles, which got me into trouble years later um, when I tried to, he told me, he said, when you're, when you're going into a skid, instead of, um, you don't put your foot on the brake, you have to, you have to like speed up. And I remember I was going into, in the very first time I rode a motorcycle, I was going into a turn and, and I don't, I probably wasn't even skidding. And I, I sped up and I went right into the ditch. So thanks, Paul Maddock for that. Ouch. Completely unpolitical. Comment. Paul Matter. What was the last one? Name? Last, one last brief word, uh, Leonard. M A T T I C K. Matic. Paul P A U L N A T T I C K. And he's still in uh, New York writing radical articles, but he's also born into art, and he's I think he's a professor at City University. I can't remember. Thank you. Could I just? I, I have a question and a comment. Jeff, do you? Do you your, your dad was not a member of the Communist Party, but was he ever affiliated with the Young Communist League? Do you know when he was a student? I I I don't know. That's not familiar to me. Because he's the same age as my father, and he my father was in that and, and the other. But the other thing that your your father said that I found much very memorable about elections. Um. Uh. I I remember telling this to to Tom Hayden at, uh, when I met him at uh, Tamament, I said, Noam Chomsky is not interested in who wins a ball game or football game. He's totally uninterested in that. Whereas Howard Zinn says the great thing about a baseball game is you never know who's going to win until the end. Whereas in an election, you know that whoever wins, you <laughs> lose. <laughs> and and, and Tom, Tom Hayden said, so it's the Zinnites versus the Chomskyites. Let's have a faction fight. <laughs> I remember that vividly. <laughs> My father enjoyed baseball very much. Where does Paul Matt is Paul Maddox uh, teaching now? Yes. Where, Sorry. You know? I mean, yes, he is. And I, I don't know if it's at uh, City University in um, New York, but if you Google him, he's been writing for the, I think it's called the Brooklyn Third Rail or some. You can find him okay. by Google. Um, Paul Maddox Jr. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking about writing him and letting him know. I just heard how he almost killed you on a motorcycle. <laughs> well, we're, 
we're getting near the end for for just one reason, which is that we we've been here a long time. We want to let Jeff go, and we are also getting hungry for pupusas right here in the um, in the auditorium. There's uh, about a dozen people here, and um, we would like to put out some tables and transform this auditorium in, into a a luncheon space and continue the conversation. Um, as per the request of a couple of people, we're just going to leave the um, the Zoom session going, and um, and but conclude by saying thank you to everybody who has joined us both on YouTube and Zoom. Um, we depend on on your help to keep this place going. Um, we have physically uh, a collection, a beautiful collection basket here, but we also have a collection basket that's called our website. You can go on there, communitychurchofboston.org, and there is a PayPal and a credit card function for you to, to help us keep this thing going. And um, I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for joining us and um, and. Keep on, keep on the conversation. Jeff, I really hope that someday uh, you can come visit us physically here in person in Copley Square and, uh, and we can um, show you the, uh, the, the collections and the, and the archives. And by that time, hopefully have more of, of Howard's uh, cassettes digitized and YouTubeized. Does that word exist? I, I don't know. Um, so thanks everybody. <laughs> Jeff, can I tell uh, Paul where to contact you? Like, where are you in the country? Uh, uh, I'm on. Uh, I'm on Cape. Who? Who? Who's? Oh, you're on the Cape. You're in the Cape. Okay. You're. Um, we said you were in Mulfleet, right? I, I live so in. Orle I live in Orleans now. Orleans. Orleans. Well, he, he can Google you. He can Google you too. Yes, he'll find me. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. It was really a pleasure. Thanks for remembering, Howard. May, may I say one word? We want to hear from Lee Fitch. I, I, it's so nice to meet you, to see you. I always considered Howard's in my friend, uh, personally. I, I mean, I, I, I own a little bookstore. I have his books. I've heard him speak so many times. I've spoken to him so many times and I've been I mean, on first name basis. And yet somehow or other, I couldn't find anything historical or anything. Um, but I do consider how, how I've always considered Howard my friend on a first name basis. I, he spoke um, in a, a group of um, peace activists with us around a circle in Winthrop more than once. Um, we were at many demonstrations at the same time. And and so forth, and it, it it's sort of funny. I, I know it's to hear the every all of the official kinds of 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 who he was. <laughs> but yeah. thank you, and thank you very very much. Thank you, a, a revered um, personage, but also a friend, and it's amazing that. He never joined community church, probably for the same reason he didn't join the Communist Party. <laughs> uh, to All right, uh, David uh, David Friedman, who, who's who's our, our friend, he says, he's, to quote uh, uh, Groucho Marx, I'd never uh, join uh, an organization that would have me as a member. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there you go. All right. Farewell. We're, we're Au gonna, revoir. We're going to have lunch, and we're going to leave the. Uh, the Zoom going for folks to, to continue the conversation. We're so thankful, Jeff, and uh, it's great to meet you in, 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 in a rectangle in a Hollywood square, but um, hope, to, hope to see you soon um, physically here. And um, we're a beautiful little, little space. We do uh, some theater stuff here, as well as more and more music and, and open mics and jazz. Folks, next Sunday, one of the finest jazz pianists in Boston, his name Michael Shea, will, will join Fulani Haynes in a tribute to Martin Luther King. The speaker is Leda Neely. And on that, we, we say goodbye to everybody and we're gonna go have some pupusas and, um, and keep the faith. Meeting at the building, soon be over. We declare